the biggest South Asian media group, Y Media. Y Media. Y Media has newspaper, midweek, radio, South Asian Pulse, television. You are watching Channel Y. Channel Y. A South Asian Canadian channel. Online South Asian Daily.com. The biggest South Asian media group. Y Media. You are watching Channel Y. Channel Y. A South Asian Canadian channel. discussion where we left uh, I have with me in, in, in the studio Mr. Jagmeet Singh I personally admire him but I also envy him he is the most well-dressed uh, <laughs> Sikh uh, here in GTA and that's not uh, and perhaps very articulate well-dressed uh, very good lawyer uh, and martial art trained so what else you need so I really envy him but I admire, <laughs> admire him as well uh, Jagmeet Ji, uh, welcome back to the studio. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you in the last episode. We talked about uh, the federal politics. Just to recap, what are your thoughts of, uh, about federal, federal politics? So I think federal politics gives uh, an amazing platform to talk about issues nationwide, but it's also a very influential element of politics. Everybody seems to know about what's going on in the federal scene. I think it's a great platform to talk about issues so that you can inspire people across the country and it's something that people tune into a lot. So I think the platform is broader. Jigmiji, uh, you've studied biology in school days, then you opted for law, yes. then you got into politics and you got into federal politics, uh, provincial politics. Now perhaps uh, many see you uh, graduating to federal politics. So where would Jagmeet Singh rest? <laughs> it's funny, uh, I was talking to some students uh, and they were saying, you know, uh, they were asking, they were asking, they were talking about what they wanted to be when they grow up. And they yeah. said, do you know what you want to be when you grow up? I said, you know, normally grown-ups do know, but now I have a decision in front of me where I don't know what I want to do. <laughs> but the, I forgot to mention, so those are the benefits of federal politics. Provincially, one of the, the amazing things about provincial politics is that it impacts you directly. Yeah. You see more of the direct impact on your life, education, health care. These are things that are directly impacting people day to day. And so that's why it's also a very important field. So it's a difficult decision. I'm, I'm thinking about it a lot. Uh, just to remind you, in our earlier episode, we talked to him about his decision, whether he would graduate to uh, federal politics or he would like to uh, remain in the provincial uh, politics. Uh, I made it simple for him. I said, <laughs> if you stay in uh, provincial politics, uh, you'll be at best uh, if NDP wins a minister. But if you are the leader of NDP uh, and uh, uh, you'll be projected as the next prime minister of Canada if NDP wins. So I made his decision making slightly simple, rest it's on. All in, on, all in him uh, to uh, take the feedback from you and make up his mind. I'm <laughs> sure he's made up his mind, but it's just that he hasn't made it public. Uh, <laughs> so when are you going to make it public? No, it's something I'm really I'm weighing. One of the things that we need to do is to run a very, to make a, a big impact, we need to make sure that we have the right team that will be truly national. And so we need to make sure that there's people across the country that, that support and believe in this idea. So part of what I'm doing right now is speaking to people across the country, asking them what they think, hearing their thoughts on it. And that's very important to make sure that we have a national support. 
and national base to be able to make this next decision. So that's why I'm, I'm taking some time. What's worrying me is that all across the globe, if you look at Brexit, if you look at America, uh, hardliners uh, being camouflaged as being uh, patriots. So at this time, don't, don't you think that a turban Sikh being projected as the next Prime Minister of India, oh, sorry, of Canada, uh, what do you think? So that's a gamble. That's the, that's the big question. Is Canada ready for it? Someone put it to me that way. Is Canada yeah. ready for you know, the first ever non-white leader of a political major political party? It's never been done before. And, and I mean, I don't think we want to do the decision just to, just to make sure that we make history. That's not my motivation. But it is important that we challenge these barriers and not let those barriers be uh, a part of the decision making. Absolutely. Just because it's never been done before, that shouldn't be the reason why we as a team decide not to do it, nor should we do it just to be the first to do it. We should do it because we can offer something meaningful to improve the lives of others. We can present a vision of Canada that actually benefits people across the country and we can provide some inspiration. If we can do these things, then I think it's a good idea. It's always, don't you think it's always a great idea to be a political rebel? And I see that political yeah. rebel in you. <laughs> uh, does it really help you evolving uh, to evolve as a good politician? It does. I mean, one of the things, some advice I received is running in a leadership race gives you an amazing opportunity to put out great ideas and it helps shape the direction of the country. So putting out these ideas will start getting people thinking about things. So I really believe in looking at inequality. And as Sikhi teaches us, we need to make sure that we create a society that's more fair. And what we're seeing in society is there's a big gap between those who have resources and those who don't. And that gap is getting wider and wider. Some people are struggling, they're working hard. It's not about hard work. There's people that are working so hard, but they're barely making it. They're barely surviving, they're barely above poverty. Some are working and they're still in poverty. So I want to talk about these issues and sometimes the opportunity to be in a leadership race gives you a great platform to talk about issues that can inspire people to do amazing things to tackle these big issues. Uh, you still haven't made up your mind, but if, if if I talk about myself, would Jagmeet Singh be able to do more good to me if he's in uh, uh, federal politics or provincial politics? I don't know. I'd have to ask you what your opinion is. Uh, I think there's a good case to be made on both sides. There's a case to be made for provincial. There's a case to be made for federal. And because that's what, the dilemma. What, what directly affects me is insurance, hydro prices, my property taxes, prop though it's a uh, local uh, uh, thing, but m it's a m municipal thing. Mm. Uh, but there are so many things which uh, which uh, which provincial government takes care. Of. Right. So, uh, what difference do you think you can make if at all you stay uh, back in provincial uh, politics? Well, those are the issues that we tackle. We talked to you mentioned a bit about a hydro. Uh, right now, we're at a crossroads where the government is selling off our hydro, and they've already sold off forty percent of our electricity system. It's our public system. It's taken about a century, a hundred years to build up the system. That's all the transmission wires you see. That's something we owned as, as a province. And without any question, without any input, without asking the people of this province, this government yep. sold off 40%. They didn't campaign on it. They didn't tell us, vote us in and we'll sell off 40% of the <coughs> electricity system. <coughs> they also didn't tell us, while we sell it off, you'll see rates are going to skyrocket. So that's a big issue, and, and as NDP, we believe in keeping it public. We would fight to restore some of that that's been sold off and try to bring it back to the public sphere so that we own it again. Uh, we would make our electricity system more fair, more affordable. We would make sure that we address auto insurance issues, temporary job agencies, a lot of issues that impact people day to day we would tackle on the provincial level. So that's why some of the debate is that the provincial issues are very big. I, I know you love cars, sport cars, <laughs> sports cars, and uh, bikes. Uh, what are you doing to cut down the insurance of your own car? <laughs> so uh, the thing is, is that I can afford it. I yeah. mean, I, I have a, a good salary, though it's less than I made as a lawyer. It's still a great salary. Mm -hmm. And it's really not about if I can afford auto insurance or, you know, I love riding bicycles. I love motorcycles. It's not an issue if I can afford it. Really, the issue is can everyday people afford it? Yeah. And that's what I'm hearing, that everyday people are telling me that they're struggling that sometimes their auto insurance bills are as much or if not more than their mortgage. Absolutely. And that doesn't make any sense to me. That seems to be so unfair. And we need to do something about it. And it's really for those people that are struggling that we need to make the changes. In India, I used to ride an iconic bike, Bullet. Oh, yes, uh, of course. But here I can't <laughs> because uh, there's no helmet where I can put on top of my uh, 
turban, my pagri. That's right. What are you doing for that? So we introduced a bill, and, and really this bill is again ag about the idea that we should celebrate people that are, that, are, that are recognizing their own religious values, their spiritual identity, their, their cultural identity. And the exemption exists in the UK, the entire United Kingdom. It exists in BC, it exists in Manitoba. And that same exemption should apply here in Ontario. There's really no reason why it shouldn't apply. And the government signaled that they would actually bring in this exemption before 2014. Kathleen Wynne, the Premier of Ontario, said we will understand this is an issue and we'll deal with it. Well, what happened after getting elected, the Premier turned around and said, you know what, uh, we're not going to do this exemption. So again, broke a promise, let down yeah. the people. It's something that can be done. I've introduced a bill in Parliament twice that lays out the exemption. It can be done. The government can pass it and we would have an exemption tomorrow. But so far, the government has indicated, the Liberal government has indicated they will not do it. But is, not safety a concern? is safety a concern? It's an important discussion, uh, safety. Right now, uh, the biggest cost to someone's health is smoking. That's one of the most lethal things that you can do to yourself. When you smoke, there's a direct connection between lung cancer and smoking. Right now, it's not illegal to smoke. People can smoke, and I don't smoke. I'm a vegetarian, I eat healthy. And those who do smoke are going to put uh, a higher cost on the healthcare system, on, a burden on the healthcare system, but it's not illegal to smoke. Let's go one step further. Diabetes is the, the biggest, um, most costly disease at its end stage. And much of this diabetes can be prevented by you know, good exercise and good nutrition. And again, people can eat bad food and not exercise, get diabetes, live a dangerous lifestyle, and then cost the healthcare system a lot. There's lots of things that we do in society that cost money. And there's a lot of lifestyle choices that people make that end up resulting in a dangerous lifestyle outcome. They get ill, they get sick. To the idea that singling out just wearing a turban because it's unsafe, is really uh, illogical. There's so many other things that cost a lot more to our society, cost a lot more to our healthcare that we allow and are legal. And somehow this one practice is, is considered too dangerous. There's a, an illogical argument here and it's an unfairness here. Another very important issue is uh, temporary job, uh, jobs and job agencies. Uh, they're trying to exploit uh, uh, perhaps somebody who doesn't have a job. So uh, how are we trying to address, the, address this issue? Uh, I know the only thing you can do is, uh, as opposition, try and talk about it. Yeah, so the, the precarious employment is one of the biggest issues that we're seeing in, in the modern age. People are no longer finding full-time stable employment. But what makes, it, what makes it even worse is they have job agencies that are set up where you get hired through an agency, you do the exact same work as someone who's permanent, yep. You, do, you, know, you put in the same number of hours, but you don't get any benefits, and you get sometimes you know, not even a little bit more than half the pay. So you're working at a company that may pay $20 an hour, and that's something that you could live off of, but the permanent worker gets $20 an hour, the full-time worker, the temporary job agency worker, he, will, he or she will only get $11 or $12, basically minimum wage. So what we wanna see is that that worker that works through an agency doing the same job, equal job, they should get equal pay. They do the exact same job, they're doing the same work, they should get benefits and the equal pay. This is something that I've been pushing for and I'll be putting forward a private member's bill on this issue soon. And I look to see some support because we need to make sure we create a society where it's easy to get hired permanently. And if someone needs to go through an agency, if some company needs an agency, that worker should not be mistreated, should not get less rights, should not be mistreated at the job, should not have their pay docked, should not, have no, should not face a scenario where they have no benefits. They should be treated with fairness, and that's what we're hoping. Affordable housing, it's another very important issue, especially in GTA area, uh, where uh, affordable housing in the sense that uh, a reasonable house is beyond the reach of a middle, middle, uh, middle class family here in GTA. What plans do you have about it to make uh, housing more affordable? So one of the solutions that we've been long pushing for, and now the government's finally moving on it, is called inclusionary zoning. So that in a, in a building, in uh, a development, in a neighborhood, that's a percentage of the housing that's, that's built should be built that's affordable. That's going to be reduced income, d reduced pay for lower income individuals. They can be able to pay for it or rent it in a way that's uh, more affordable. We also looked at uh, cooperative housing where people pool the resources to buy a unit in an in a apartment or in a house. There's also the idea that the government can just build housing that's very you know, well designed, that's uh, free from stigma, that has an affordability to it, that's built in a way that people can afford it. We need to do something about it. 
the, the main thing is that there needs to be some action. Right now there's complete inaction. Either we need the government to build new houses, we need to ensure that there's more affordable houses built into an existing structure, uh, or we need to look at other creative solutions like cooperative housing where people pool their money to buy uh, a building together or buy a house together. There's got to be some solution because right now we're yes. in a scenario where people graduate, get a job, and can't even dream of affording to buy a new house. True, so true. Uh, what's driving the house? property prices. Uh, in the last about two years, uh, most of the places it's, it's doubled uh, from uh, say 300,000, 400,000 to 800,000. Uh, the gap between haves and have nots is, is growing in Canada, yes. especially in GTA. Mm -hmm. Don't you think it's a serious problem? Uh, those who can afford, they can book houses, uh, wait for a year, m get about $300,000 on, on the small booking amount and uh, you know, dividing people who, can, who really need those houses. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, issues. I mean, housing is just one example, but in general, we're seeing that wealth is being concentrated in less and less hands. And that is not good for innovation. It's not good for developing a healthy society. It's not good for developing a healthy economy. When we have more and more wealth in less and less hands, it makes an unfair society. And that society is not stable. It's not, uh, it's not a healthy society. And so we need to make sure we develop policies that address this. First of all, we need to admit that it's happening. So it's good that you asked the question because first we have to acknowledge it's happening. Then we need to develop policies that address it directly. So whether that's new, new tactics of, of uh, making sure that there is a redistribution of the income so that people who don't have resources have access to it, whether that's addressing things like tuition fees, then now more and more we're seeing that education is becoming something that is unattainable. It's so expensive. I give you my personal example. When I went to law school, the tuition fee was about 8000 a year. Now, eight days in a year is, is something that you can wrap your head around. Yeah. Now, currently, the same university, uh, Osgoode Hall University, for law school, is almost 30000 a year. And just you know, a short period of time now, it's, uh, it's so unattainable. Three years of law school will, will be a $90,000 cost. I couldn't afford my further studies here. Right? Canada. Imagine that, $90,000. Yeah. And when I did it, my three years cost me $24,000. Right? That's so, it's drastically different. You know, you could wrap your head around how do I pay back a debt of twenty-four thousand? Yeah. To pay back a debt close to a hundred thousand is just it's it's unbelievable. Uh, n switching gears, um, terrorism. Uh, it's an important issue where uh, no no country in this world is immune. And uh, intelligence reports from across the border, from U.S., from internal Canadian uh, intelligence agency, says that in near future Canada may not be immune from uh, global terrorism. What's your views on this? How do we need to tackle this problem? Well, I think we have a lot of good evidence that suggests that you know, a, str a good, balanced, fair uh, foreign policy I is what works towards creating a more safe society. If you have a good foreign policy that's respectful, you're, you'll see um, th that result in, a, in a, a safer environment to, to grow up and to live and to develop. So there's a connection between your foreign policy and domestic security. Um, I think that one of the key issues is that in anything we do with respect to domestic security, and it's important to make sure that we have safety and security, people know that they can live their life in a way that's free from violence. We know that there is often the desire to reduce liberties to increase security, and that's something we cannot do. It is a failure of our democracy, and it's a, f and it's a, it's a dis sign of disrespect to all the work that our previous, you know, ancestors or people before us have done to build a fair and just society if we erode those liberties just to maybe increase and and with maybe there's no even no evidence to suggest that it actually will increase security but this this threat of fear of uh, fear of violence and terrorism often results in people arguing more security means less liberties i don't believe in that and i think we can find a way to increase our if we need to wherever it's just in a fair way, our security, but at the same time, never reducing our liberties. Uh, as I'm talking to you, uh, a thought is coming to my mind. Uh, two, Sikh tur uh, t two turban Sikhs in the, in the federal uh, cabinet, uh, Har Sajjan Singh and Mr. Uh, Navdeep Bans. Uh, how do you rate their performances? Though they're not rated as, as, nicely, as uh, nicely dressed as you, but uh, <laughs> uh, how do you rate their performance? Listen, I mean, it's a bit difficult for me to rate them objectively because I see uh, someone that's breaking barriers, you know, the first ever person of a racialized background um, sporting, uh, 
having a beard and turban at the level of a national defense minister, it's something that's just amazing it's to amazing, see. Yeah, and having um, someone that's described as a minister of everything, uh, Navdeep Singh, that's an amazing thing to see, right? And so it's hard to gauge, to be critical of them on that. Uh, on the minister of everything, on, on Navdeep Benz, <laughs> uh, I don't see, I, I haven't been able to point out or, or notice any sort of key, key issues. With uh, Harjit Sajjan, on the, on the military front, I know that there's been certain, certain promises made about demilitarization when it comes to conflicts in the world in Syria. There was a promise to stop bombing, and, and that was a good promise. You know, it's, it's hard to work towards peace if we're engaged in a military operation, which we don't really know if there's a clear benefit, and we know that innocent lives are being lost. And so there was a promise to break away from the bombing. But on the flip side, there seems to be an increase in military presence though. So the promise was to kind of reduce that presence, but on the other hand, it seems to be that they were increasing the presence. So that's a criticism that I can make that if the, the, the idea, the campaign was to reduce our presence, then, then it doesn't seem to me to be the right thing to then increase it on the other hand. So that's one, I think, point I can India make. doesn't even have one uh, Sikh in the cabinet and here you have two terms. Oh, it's amazing. Sikhs. It's amazing. amazing. So would you compliment uh, Justin Trudeau for this? Oh, of course. There's no doubt. You, yeah. you, can't, you can't not compliment. Um, having a gender parity in, in cabinet is also a great sign. Having equal men and women and also having people from different backgrounds and particularly having six is, is something that all racialized people, I think, are celebrating. And now we have a minister of immigration who's from a Somali yeah. background. So and these are refugee. great, these are, these are great he, things. He was yeah. a refugee once. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, one more thing you need to compliment, maybe uh, you may agree or may not agree with me. Harjit Singh, Harjit Sachin, uh, he can do 30 push-ups in one go. I saw that in the fa on the Facebook. He yeah, it's great. I mean, with. fitness is important and he's leading by example, so that's a can, great thing. Can you compete with him with yeah, for the sure. 30, 30 push-ups? No problem. So no problems if... Uh, <laughs> Someone's listening, if Harjit Sajjan is listening, uh, you have a competition here in, uh, <laughs> in Mr. Jagmeet Singh. He can match up those 30 push-ups. So, yes. uh, one important thing, uh, many see you uh, as someone who's close to hardline Sikh ideology. Mm -hmm. I actually, I, I don't agree, I'm just listening. Yep. What, what do you mean by that, actually? Uh, some would see that uh, you, sometimes you would openly sympathize with the thought of uh, Khalistan. So, any thoughts on that? that? Well, I think it's established uh, anyone who believes in civil liberties would support anyone's right to self-determination. So uh, we saw Pres Prime Minister Harper also say that, you know, everyone has a right to, to talk about self-determination. It's a United Nations represented or recognized right. So I think that's, and we have in Canada, we have parties that, that support the right to self-determination. The Bloc Québécois and the Parti Québécois yeah. are political parties that talk about that. So I think that's a bit of a mood issue. I mean, no one has a problem with supporting United Nations rights. Hypothetically putting tomorrow, if you were the Prime Minister of Canada, don't you think these issues could be a stumbling block in the foreign policy of Canada? No, I, I don't think that, I mean, I'm pretty confident that anyone in Canada agrees with the Charter of Rights that's been laid out by the United Nations. And I don't think anyone has an issue with that. I mean. We have political parties here in Canada. Um, I think that everyone supports this idea, this notion that anyone should be able to determine their, their future, whether it's in, you know, in Spain, there's uh, communities that are talking about their determination. There's communities uh, in, South a in Africa where recently a new country was made. So whether people determine to make their own country or not, this is up to those individuals. And that right to discuss that is something that all you know, peaceful, democratic, loving, uh, human rights supporting people agree with. So I don't think that's an issue. Uh, that, that's the end of our part two with uh, Mr. Jagmeet Singh. A wonderful discussion. I really had a uh, wonderful time. I really enjoyed uh, talking to him. Uh, what else you need? Uh, he's a wonderful person, good look looking uh, Sikh, uh, very articulate, uh, a successful lawyer, uh, politically correct uh, when he speaks uh, uh, politically, and someone who's uh, now perhaps we can see him on the, on the federal level uh, and you never know. Uh, come elections uh, in two years or three years from now, he would be projected as the Prime Minister candidate of uh, NDP. You never know. So uh, he's the guy who's uh, turning it very fast. And uh, all best of luck from our side uh, and wish you all the luck. And thanks for joining us. I really had a wonderful time. I hope you enjoyed uh, this discussion. And uh, we're hoping that in future you could spare some more time uh, uh, for us. And uh, we'll, we'll be honored to have you here. Uh, thanks. Thank, thank you. you very much. Final words from you? No, thank you. It was a great pleasure to be here as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, that's it for now. This is the space we'll try and get uh, some important people uh, who could talk to you and share uh, their views. Uh, that's it for now. Keep watching channel now. Uh, good night. Thank you. Channel Y, a South Asian Canadian channel. Call Rogers or Bell today and subscribe to Channel Y. Channel Y. For more information, visit SouthAsiaDaily.com. You are watching Channel Y. Channel Y. A South Asian Canadian channel.